Previously on Coram Dale. I'm just asking you today, do you have a 2020 vision for your new year? The literal translation of Coram Deo is before the eyes of God. How appropriate that we're going into 2020 year that we would live a year before the eyes of God. How many of us have made bad decisions that we then had to deal with? And God says, I was there. Just because of your lack of awareness of his presence does not negate the fact that his presence was there. You cannot run from his spirit. You cannot hide from his presence. This is the heartbeat behind Coram Deo. He's in your midst. And he's saying to you, I see you. I'm right here. And he's not saying, I see you in a way like, ah, I see you better behave. That's not at all what he's saying. He's saying, I'm here. I can help you. Would you invite me? Just because you don't acknowledge the presence of God doesn't mean you are far from his sight. What's God going to do in your new year? Do you have a promise from God for this year? Are you ready to live a year before the eyes of God? God. We're going to pick up right where we left off. Our key text for this series is Genesis 28 in verse 16. And last week, we kind of left off with this idea, have you awakened to the presence of God? Have you awakened to the presence of God? And so here's our text. In Genesis 28, 16, it says this. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Right? He was not awakened to the presence of God. That did not mean that God wasn't there. He just didn't know. He was asleep. I lived in Oklahoma for a period of time when I was going to Bible school. And one morning, my roommate and I, we woke up and we went to school and everybody from our apartment complex were like, where were you guys last night? And we were like, what are you talking about? We were in our apartment sleeping. And they're like, you guys didn't hear the tornado sirens? Everybody was evacuated to the tornado shelter. A tornado came through a mile, a mile away or like a few blocks away from our apartment complex. And we're like, yo, we're from New York. <laughs> we don't have tornado sirens. And even if we heard the sirens, we want to know what to do about it. Right? So although the sirens were there, it didn't wake us up. The siren was blasting, womp, 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 womp. We didn't hear it. We were asleep through the storm. We were asleep through the presence of a tornado. We had no idea it was there. And I'm telling you today, just because you don't feel God, just because you're not hearing God, does not mean that God's not there. Jacob is saying, I was not aware that the presence of God was here. Search your Bible. Search your Bible. Because I hear people say all the time, well, listen, Mike, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to hear from God because he speaks to us in a still, small voice. And that still, small voice, I mean, sometimes you just don't know if it's God or not. I've got a problem with this. i got a problem with this doctrine. I have a problem with this theology. My dad raised me to believe that every truth that must be established must be spoken out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. And the only story in the Bible that says that God speaks to us in a still small voice is the story of Elijah in a cave. And a storm came through, right? An earthquake came through and God wasn't in it. And the winds came through and God wasn't in it. But then came a still small voice and he heard God. The only time in scripture that it says that he heard him in a still small voice. There are tons of other Bible stories 
where it says that God spoke and man heard. God visited Joshua and said, Joshua, this is how I want you to lead my people. And it was very detailed instructions. Could it be that the voice of God is really wah, 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 but we're asleep to it? Could it be that God is shouting your name, but you're not attuned to it? It's easier to believe that it's a still small voice because that's why I'm not hearing it. It's easier to believe, well, well, God's just speaking so softly that I just can't find him. It's harder to believe that you actually haven't taken time to ever fast and, and deny yourself and shut off TV and shut off social media to hear from God. Right? Come on, I'm just throwing some stuff out there today. I'm just throwing some stuff out there. Jacob left his family. Jacob left his home because this is what God instructed him to do. He was actually on a mission to go find a bride. Right? He's, he's on his way to find a bride. He's obeying his father. And, and simply the only reason why he stopped where he stopped was because it was nighttime. Uh, they believed that he had traveled 90 miles. Now think about this. 90 miles doesn't seem like a lot. It's from here a little bit past New York City. That's easy for us to travel. This dude was walking it. So go ahead and walk from here to New York City. Have fun. Right? It, it was a while. And I said that it was nighttime. He laid down to sleep. He has a dream. He has a dream that angels are going from heaven to earth, back and forth, and, and God makes a promise to him. He says, Jacob, I was the God of your grandfather, Abraham. I was the, father of, I was the God of your father, Isaac, and I want to be your God. And if you will follow me and do what I command, I will bless you. He says to him, the land that you are laying on is yours. He goes, and as far as you can see to the north and to the south and to the east and to the west, I'm giving unto you. He says, I will make your descendants as great as the stars. It's the same promise. He gave his grandfather. It's the same promise that he gave his father. Right? This story tells us that it is possible to be in the very presence of God and not be aware of it. I'm just going to point some, just, let's just be honest and open. There are some times that you're in a church service and you see somebody, they're on the floor and they're crying and they're like, oh my God, the, you know, God is doing a work. And you're like, I feel nothing but the air conditioning. <laughs> it is possible for one person to be having an experience with God and another person saying, I don't feel anything. It comes back to our awareness. It comes back to our disciplines to say, do I, am I seeking God in a way that's real for me, okay? Jacob tells us that God was here all along and I was not aware of it. Now watch this. Paul tells us later in Ephesians, I mean, I'm sorry, in Galatians, Galatians 2.20, Paul says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that live in me. In me. Right? It's not possible to be outside of God's presence as a Christian if God lives in you. <laughs> Impossible. Impossible to be anywhere outside of his presence when he's inside you. But that doesn't mean that we're always aware of it. I was in Bible school when Kenneth Hagin was still alive, Pop Hagin for those of you that know about the Word of Faith movement. He's one of the founding fathers of the faith movement. And I was in one of his last classes that he preached before he passed away. And he made a statement one day that made me so angry. He stands up there in front of this class of 2,000 students and he says, God is more real to me than my wife laying in bed next to me when I lay down at night. And I was like, that's bull. He's up there lying. Like, he's a liar. He's, he's full of it. Like, I can't believe this guy's saying it. Like, he, he's say, selling this pipe dream to us all that, that we can experience God as real as a human being lying next to us. But he had disciplined himself 
to be aware of that presence. Years later, I just realized I was carnal. That as much works as I kept doing to try to impress God, I got to read my Bible more, I got to pray more, I got to do more. The, the truth of the matter was I was trying to earn God's presence instead of just relaxing in his presence. Yeah. Woo! Genesis 28, 17, the very next verse. So Jacob wakes up, he says, surely the presence of the Lord is here. Genesis 28, 17, he says, and he was afraid. This word afraid doesn't mean that he was scared. It means he was awestruck. He was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this. He says, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Jacob was, in, was awestruck by this experience that he had just had with God. I want you to remember for a second the day that you made a decision to be a Christ follower. The day that you said, okay, this belief system is what I want to commit my eternity to. What was it about that moment that made you awestruck and said, yes, this is truth? Right? Because he's having one of those moments. He's having one of those come to faith moments. And the only thing that's changed, circumstance hasn't changed. His environment hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is his awareness of God. That's it. That's it. He's awestruck by the fact that he just now was aware that God has been with him. Then he calls this place the gate of heaven. This confuses me, right? I'm like, okay, so this is the gate of heaven. What does this mean? That all of us have to go to Israel somewhere before we die, and that's how we enter heaven? Like, is that what he's saying here? This is the gate of heaven? No. I mean, we, we obviously understand that that's not the truth. What this means is, in this vision, he was seeing angels ascending and descending between heaven and earth. He was seeing the blessings flowing, and God saying, listen, I'm with you, I want to bless you, and, and, then, and then Jacob was making promises back, and there's this open heaven. What, he, what he's saying is, I now see that I'm under an open heaven. I now see that I'm under the shadow of the Almighty, that I'm at the gate of heaven. That, that, that there's this conversation, there's communication between the two of us, all right? I believe what he saw was the embodiment of the Lord's prayer in Matthew 6, 9, when Jesus says, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe he's saying there that there should be an openness between the two. That when there's something we desire, there's something that we need, that God is backing it. And there's this openness between the two realms. We live under an open heaven. The God of the universe, the God of the universe has placed all his resources at our disposal. But we don't live that way. We don't live that way because we're not aware of his presence. I'm just throwing it out, just trying to show you guys where we're at. The very next verse, Genesis 28, 19, he says, Then Jacob arose early in the morning. Say, early. early. You didn't want to hear that, did you? You did not want to hear that. I'm like, yeah, but I'm not a morning person. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob arose early in the morning. There's something about rising early in the morning. There's something about rising early in the morning, getting something done, getting something accomplished, Right? Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head, and he set it as a pillar, right? We have a stone here today. That would be a pretty big pillow if you uh, tried to sleep on that. He took this pillow, and there's something about the fact that he had used it to support his head and, and what that resembles, but we don't have time to get into all that today. But he took this stone. And he placed it as a pillar, as a memorial, as a statement. Not as a headstone to recount the past. Not a gravestone 
to have accounted for what's, what once existed but no longer does. He set this as a pillar for what's to come in the future. He takes this and he pours oil on it and he makes a promise to God. Genesis 28, 20, he says, and he called the place that he had placed this stone and poured oil upon it, he names this place Bethel. But the name of the city was previously called Luz. Bethel means house of God, place of worship. Next week, we're going to talk about, have you ever found yourself in Loserville? <laughs> right? Loserville, Luz. He was previously called Luz. He renamed the place. Then Jacob made a vow. Say vow. vow. He makes a promise. He makes a commitment. He makes a vow. He says, if God be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on so that I may come back to my father's house in peace. He's trying to make a deal with God. He's trying to make a bargain with God. I remember back when I heard from God that I was supposed to be the pastor of this church. My whole life, my dad would tell me, son, one day, they're gonna be pastor of church, one day, we would drive up to the building when we were building it, and he would just be like, son, one day, all this is gonna be yours. And every time he'd say that to me, I'd be like, inside, but I don't want it. Right? Because that's just rebellion. All of us do it. When someone tells you, well, this is what you have to do. Oh, yeah? It's my life. <laughs> I'm going to do what I want with it. Uh, come on. Somebody fighting it right now. <laughs> my life. I'm going to do what I want. You're going to tell me what I'm going to do. And I remember the day that I felt from God that this is what I was supposed to do. It was not a happy day. Because then I had to go back and admit to my dad that he was right. <laughs> huh? <laughs> but I remember that day that God said, this is what you're supposed to do. And I sat down and said, okay. If this is it, if this is what I'm going to commit my life to, if I'm going to invest the rest of my life to do this thing, then I've got some conditions. <laughs> you ever try to make a deal with God? Yeah, it don't work out very well. But I had some conditions, right? I sat down, I said, all right, God, if I'm gonna do this, then here's my conditions. And I'm not gonna tell you what those conditions are. I don't trust you. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying, this is what Jacob is saying. God, if you do what you just said, if you do what you just said, if you would keep me in this way and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, I mean, he set the bar really low. He just said, as long as I have clothes and food, then I'll serve you. That's pretty low bar, especially when he just came out of Isaac's house. They weren't poor. Huh? If you do all these things, then the Lord shall be my God. Say, my God. <sighs> Thank you, Brendan. <laughs> my God. My God. To this point, he was known as the God of Abraham. To this point, he was known as the God of Isaac. But until now, he was not known as the God of Jacob. See, we know these stories later on. We know 2,000 years later that in Hebrews it talks about the, the hall of fame of faith, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But that hadn't been written yet. So far, he was just the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac. And it was like, what's up, Jake? What's good? Am I going to be your God too? And something that I learned as I'm reading this God doesn't have grandchildren. God has sons. Ooh. 
God don't have grandkids. He has sons, which means it don't matter that your granddaddy and your grandmama serve Jesus. Are you? It don't matter that you were raised in a Christian home and your mom and dad went to church and did the cross every day. Do you know him? Do you know him? Is he, is he your God? Is, the, is he the God of today? Is he the God of your present? Or is he the God of, well, one day? Someday. I'll, I'll do this church thing. I'll do the God thing one day. For right now, I'm kind of busy. He says, then you shall be my God. And this stone, put this up on the screen, and this stone which I have set as a pillar shall be God's house. There has to be a chief cornerstone in your life. He says, the stone I set shall be God's house. This stone right here is going to be in this room for the remainder of 2020. All right, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen a little bit later at the end of the service here. But this stone is going to sit here, not at this spot, maybe off to the side, for 2020. It'll be a pillar in the house of God. Watch this. And then he finalizes his promise back to God. And all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Ah, right, here we go. I knew it. I knew, I knew they were going to have to talk about money. The first thing we want to look at is that Jacob sets a stone as a memorial. As a memorial. Not a memorial of the past, but a memorial of what's to come. That every time he would pass that stone, he would remember the experience that he had with God and the promises that God made to him and the promises that he made to God. Do you have some promises of God? that you are standing on for 2020? Do you have a promise of God? Is there something in the word of God that you're saying, I am standing on this word for our household and for my life for 2020? If not, I would say that you're not going into 2020 with 2020 vision. Amen. It's been said that hindsight is 2020. It's easy to stop at the end of the year and look back at everything that God did. But could you get a promise for what God's going to do? There's a difference. There's a difference. See, there's thankfulness when you can look back at what God did. But there's passion and commitment and drive and motivation when you have a word for what God's going to do. <laughs> Jacob knew God as the God of his grandfather and the God of his father, but someone else's relationship with God is not enough for you. Your granddad's relationship with God's not gonna get you to heaven. Your mom and dad's relationship with God is not going to get you to heaven. He has to be your God. And that's when it changes. That's when the whole thing shifts. He says, you will be my God. Jacob, I've been looking for the access into your life. I've been looking for a way to come into your life and bless you exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ever ask or think. And you just gave me access by making me your God. Secondly, and we do got to talk about it, he sets the stone as a memorial to remind him that every, every time he passed this, because remember he said, when I come back this way, if you allow me to return to my father's house in peace, right, that he will stop back at this stone. He'll stop back at this stone, he will praise God, he will worship God, and he would present a tithe of what he had increased at this altar, okay? So, two quick minutes on this. Jacob promises a tithe to God of all his increase. Uh, a tithe means a tenth, 
okay? But actually in that time, it was more like 26%. Um, anyway, we don't need to get into all that. I will give them a tithe. And, and, and where did this come from? See, because in the, in the dream, God didn't show him that. In the vision, it wasn't angels going up and down and then him having to come and pay tithe. That wasn't in the dream. Where did he get the idea to give God a tenth of everything that he was increased? Well, he saw his grandfather do it, and he saw his father do it. He's like, well, granddad always did this, and he was blessed. Dad always did this, and he was blessed. I guess it would be well for me to do it as well. Now, what we also have to understand, because I was like, man, does he have to do that? This is before the law. The Mosaic law hasn't even come into play yet. The Mosaic law, they were commanded to. They were demanded to. They had to. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob fully lived under the same dispensation or the same relationship with God that we have today called grace. Grace. The un earned favor of God, the open heaven favor of God, blessings coming up, blessings coming down out of relationship with him. Jacob didn't have to do nothing. He didn't have to do nothing. That's bad English. He didn't have to do nothing. He made the vow. He made the vow. God didn't say, I'll give you the land that you're laying on as far as east is from the west, north to south, east, west, and then to descendants. I'll give you, if you pay your tithe. Jacob said, I'm in awe that you would pass the mantle blessing to me. Because remember, he stole it. This should be Abraham, Isaac, Esau. He stole this joint. We don't, even need to, we don't even need to get into that. <laughs> He's like, I'm in awe that God would choose me to impact my community, to impact my generation, to impact the world. And God, out of a thankful heart, knowing that I'm so undeserving of this. I mean, listen, he knows he stole a birthright. He knows what he did. God, I, I'm so undeserving of the blessings that you have just promised me. Out of that heart, I will serve you. I will give to you. Not out of necessity, not out of compulsion, not out of law, not because I have to, but out of relationship, I give to you. Jacob ensured that the tithe that he had seen from his ancestors would remain holy and the Lord's. Then he takes a step further. He then takes a jar of oil, and I'm pretty sure it was very expensive oil. It was probably all the oil he had for the whole trip. And he takes that oil, and he pours it over a rock. It was symbolic of dedication. Anytime something spiritual would occur throughout scripture, they would seal it with a dedicated ceremonial oil. Let's look back to David. This David, maybe you've heard of him, King David, ruled over Israel. But before he was ever King David, he was David the shepherd boy. The prophet Samuel says, I know to whom I'm called to go bring and anoint as the next king. He goes into the house of Jesse. He's looking for his, the, the son of Jesse to be the next king. He goes through all of the sons and he says, no, the one who's called to be king is not here. Surely there must be another son. And they're like, wait, wait, wait. You mean the illegitimate redheaded stepchild? Come on. A lot of us are illegitimate when it comes to deserving God's grace. Come on. The illegitimate, red-headed stepchild, he don't even got the same mom as all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring him in. 
Bring him in. David walks in. The prophet says, that's him. Wait a second. The oldest brother, he's tall and strong, handsome. David's just like skinny little runt. So yeah, he's the one. He pulls out a ram's horn of oil and he pours it over David's head and dedicates him the next king of Israel. The oil represents a dedication to the vow. I vow before God. And I asked you last week to, to pray and come up with a word that 2020 meant to you. What God was going to do in your life in 2020. And I know that's hard. I know that was hard. Some of you don't even have a word. And that's totally fine. You can still participate in what we're doing today. Right? Even if you feel today that you're not ready to participate in what we're doing, this will be in the room all year and a station will be set up. And during any time of worship, you could go up to this and you could have a same prayer, same kind of prayer moment that we're going to do today. All right? So the oil was used as dedication. The oil was also used to seal the promise. To seal the promise. Before you came in first service, you could see that this stone has 2020 carved into it. Once the oil has now covered the rock and has penetrated into the rock, it's kind of sealed it. It changed the color of it. Right? It was more of a light gray rock, and now it's dark, sealed, gray rock. You can't even see the carving. It doesn't pop out as much anymore. Ephesians 1.13 tells us, In whom you've also trusted, after you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you have believed. So he's saying, listen, you heard the word of God, you believed. When you believed, and, 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 and now Christ comes and lives inside of you, watch this, you were sealed. You have been sealed with a promise of the Holy Spirit. You've been sealed with a promise of the Holy Spirit. And I love this. It doesn't say that you sealed yourself. Because if you create the seal, you could break the seal. But because you didn't make the seal, you can't break the seal. Come on, man. You've been sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is the same kind of seal that Jacob is pouring over this rock. You know, when we accept Jesus Christ, God pours the Holy Spirit upon us and we're sealed. We're sealed with a vow. And he says, I will be your God and you will be my child. <laughs> Today, I want you to seal your year. I want you to seal the vow. I want you to seal the word. I want you to seal the promise of what God's going to do. I want you to lock it in. Right? Just like a good interest rate at the bank or a good mortgage rate. I want you to lock it in. Right? I want you to lock it in. What's the word? What's the promise? What's the change? What's the move? What's the thing that God's going to do in your life? And then we're going to seal it. We're going to seal it. And this rock's going to stay in this room all year. So that every time you come into worship, you see the promise. And you see the promise. And, and you see the promise. And you see the promise. During any time of worship throughout the year, maybe you break your promise. You got to know God's not going to. But maybe you do. Because we do. Right? Anytime throughout the year. Maybe you said, God, I'm never going to. Don't. Oh, do not. Do not make that promise to God. I will never do this. Don't do that. Justin Bieber said it best. I will never say never. <laughs> All right. But let's just say you do, and you break a promise. At any time in a worship service, a worship experience, you can come back with no shame, no guilt, no judgment, and recommit it. And I reseal it. I recommit. I come back. 
Because maybe singing songs isn't your way to worship. Maybe something like this is. We're going to have a communion station set up uh, throughout the year. And at any time during a worship moment that you feel that you want to participate in the Lord's Supper and, and taking communion, you could leave your seat, go up to that station and take communion. Not in any way that you're being a show or getting attention, but we understand that people connect with the presence of God in different ways. And if we don't create other ways that people can experience the presence of God, we, we, people might be missing out on the way that they would experience God. But today, you can't experience the presence of God unless you have the Spirit of God. Amen. It's the first step. It's the first step. Becoming a believer in Jesus. Locking in eternity. Locking in your salvation. That's the start. That's the beginning step. And so before we go any further, we need to take a moment and make sure we're locked in. Make sure we're sealed up, right? We make sure we're winterized. <laughs> that we're ready for, for this commitment and what God wants to do in our lives. So if you're in here today and you've never had an opportunity to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, we want to pray with you today. And we're not going to call you forward and make a show of it. Just right where you are, say, Lord, I, I need a change in my life. I need a Savior. And we want to pray that prayer with you. And because we're family, we pray it out loud like this. Dear God, I come to you just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I invite you into my life to change me and to make me new. Thank you for accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we, before we move forward, I want to give you guys some instructions. I want to tell you what's going to happen. We are going to take a moment and collect uh, and continue to worship by presenting our tithe and our offering to the Lord. The ushers are going to just come down the aisles. They'll pass the buckets. When that's done, if you choose to be part of this today, if, if there's something that you want to experience with God, if there's a word that you have, if you just want to lock the year in, maybe just your year is fresh start, new me. Whatever it is, all right? I have, I have a couple things that I'm dealing with that, that the Lord is showing me that I'm working on, all right? Here's what I want you to do. These two sections are going to come to those aisles. Those two sections are going to go out to those aisles. And then I know that none of us are good with merge lanes. <laughs> but there'll be a merge lane like right here, you know, and just kind of take your turn. I have the math down. If you take about three seconds per person, it'll take 30 minutes, okay? Um, <laughs> trust, I had to do the math. We're about to go through two and a half gallons of oil, right? Two and a half gallons of oil in about 30, 35 minutes. If you take three seconds each, we should get through it pretty soon. It's going to look like massive and crazy and like we're going to be here for hours. It'll go fast. I promise you this. I promise you that if you stay to the end, uh, we're going to do a prayer at the end. Uh, it's a pretty powerful moment. If you need to leave, if you want to leave, if you don't have a word, if this is not your thing, no judgment. I'm totally cool with that too. Uh, but just wait till after offering. Children's ministry has something called Blizzard Blast going on, and your kids are totally excited about it, and they will hate you forever if you pick them up early. <laughs> so that's a lie. Um, but if you just give them till after 12:30, uh, before you pick up your kids, they would be most happy with that. Amen? Amen. Father, we present our tithe and our offering to you. We present it to you in a way, not expecting anything in return from you, God. But we present it to you because we love you, because we thank you for the blessings that you've already put on our lives. Lord, I thank you that your word will never return to you void, but will accomplish exactly what you set it forth to do. We present our tithe to you today with a joyful heart, with gladness. We thank you for what you have in store for the kingdom of God at large in 2020. And we want to be part of that. So we sow into that today in Jesus' name. Amen. Ushers, you can go ahead and put the buckets out. Listen, we'll wait till that's done. But I want to read to you this in Habakkuk 2.3. Habakkuk 2.3 says this, For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end 
it shall speak and not lie. Though it may tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. It won't be forever. Listen, David was anointed to be king around 16 years old, but he didn't become king until a lifetime later. I don't know what you've been believing God for. I don't know what you've been standing on the word for, but I have this feeling in my spirit that 2020 might be your year. 2020 might be the year. I'm gonna tell you why. Because the word appointed time is the word moed. Moed, like mowed the lawn, M-O-W-E-D, moed. And the meaning of this word moed means for the right time, listen, or a divinely chosen time. A divinely chosen time. And I believe what God is saying to us within this year of 2020, he says that I've been watching over my word. Come on. I've been watching over my word to perform it. And I'm going to perform it in your life this year. I'm going to perform it in your life this year. I truly and honestly am not trying to hype you up. I'm not. I'm not that guy. Seriously. And even as I say it, I'm like, wow, this could really be weird. This could be taken too far. But if we're right, if the urgency that we're feeling in our spirit across the church world at large, if if this is a Moed moment, if this is a Moed generation, if if we are a Moed people, a, a divinely appointed people at a divinely appointed time, then there's an urgency to act upon what God has told us to do. But I'm afraid. I I don't know what to do. God says, yeah, but I'm I'm right there with you. I told first service this story, and it didn't go over very well. And I know it's just the generation that we're in. But when I was a kid, my next-door neighbor stole my big wheel. Does anybody know what a big wheel is? (laughs) Had that big, yeah. My next door neighbor stole my big wheel. And so I came inside. I'm like, oh, Dad, Daddy, my neighbor stole my big wheel. He said, so go over and get it. I said, I'm like, yo, but Dad, why don't you go over there and get the? He says, boy, boy. So it's just when you know my dad, my dad, boy, go over there and get your big wheel. So I go over there and I go to grab my big wheel. And when I do, the kid punches me in my mouth. Now, what you may not know about me is that I am by nature actually introverted, right? I am. I'm just assertive. But as a kid, I was very shy. I was very introverted. This kid punched me in my mouth. And I run back home. And I walk back inside. And my dad's like, stop it. And what's up? And I was like, I went to get my, my big wheel. And he punched me in the mouth. He said, boy, this is what you're going to do. Boy, this is what you're going to do. You're going to walk back over there, and you're not going to say a word. You're not going to say nothing. You're not even going to look at the big wheel. You're going to walk up to that kid, and with everything that's within you, you are going to kung fu punch him in the mouth. Now, I know I just lost some people from coming to our church. There's other churches down the street that are okay, that are okay with continuing to let the devil steal from them. There's churches down the street that are like, well, you know, I mean, the devil stole my finances and the devil stole my my sanity and the devil stole my emotions, but I mean, what am I going to do after all? We're going to kung fu punch him in the mouth. It was the loneliest walk of my life. (laughs) We lived in the meadows, a townhouse in the meadows. And as I walked out of the front door of the meadows, I'm all by myself. I'm like, (laughs) I ain't never punched nobody in the mouth. (laughs) 
It's like, Dad, but Dad, why don't you, Dad, why don't you just go talk to the parents about, no, 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 go get your big wheel. Since I was a kid, my parents have raised me to go get what's mine. Walk down the sidewalk, down the sidewalk, scared, alone, but I know what my daddy said. So I was like something out of a movie, kind of like I was already shaking. I was shaking on the inside. I walked down. I walked up to this kid. He was bigger than me. And I was like, ah! took my big wheel. There was a confidence that came in victory. There was a confidence that came when receiving back that which was mine, that my dad knew, my dad knew if my son would just experience a victory, if he would just trust me. See, something that I didn't know that my dad knew is that my dad's been wrestling me, and my dad's been training me, and my dad knew the strength that I had, even though I didn't know the strength I had. He knew it was within me. He knew, yes, son, even though that kid's bigger than you, he ain't been training the way you've been training. I'm telling you, you may have gone through something in 2019 that was just training. That was just a muscle building experiment, experience. That, that, okay, it was hard, but it was building something in you. And I'm not saying that God did it. What I am saying is, you're ready. You're ready for a new season. You ready for a new you? Father, we come to the name of Jesus, Lord, as we prepare for this moment as the worship team comes and gets into place, that we thank you, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would rise up on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit would equip us, quicken us, give us a word, speak to us. We pray that the presence of God is here in this place. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that relationships are going to be restored this year. Finances are going to be restored this year. Health is going to be restored to our bodies this year. Anything that has been tried to been stole from us from decades past, repaid in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for what you have in store for us this year. We commit it to you. We dedicate it to you. We seal it with a promise to you. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. You guys can go ahead and move out of your seats, kind of come and...